Salaam alaikum, brothers and sisters. Let's continue with our very interesting discussion. Looking at the Christian missionaries, looking at the atheist missionaries, because atheism has become now a missionary belief system. Do you really think that merely running things on a voluntary basis, we are going to be able to compete with that type of attack? I certainly do not believe so. I do not believe so. I believe we need dedicated people. I believe we need universities dedicated to learning how to give dawah. I do believe that it has to be almost a career path for people. And I don't mean a career, obviously, in the mal-a'malu bin niyati. If your intention is to become a da'i because you want to make money, that's what you'll get. You won't get reward from it. You'll get your money and you won't get the ajr. But in terms of our need, we definitely, in my opinion, need dedicated, focused organizations and teams of people to be giving dawah. I definitely believe that. And I believe that that's part of the obligation of fulfilling this ayah. But that does not mean that ordinary people do not still have the responsibility. You know, you have a neighbor who is non-Muslim. You speak to them every day. The brothers who are giving da'wah may never get to come to see them. Does that mean, therefore, you have an excuse because you didn't talk to your neighbor? No. It doesn't mean that. You still have that obligation. But the obligation here, وَالْتُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ means that we need a focused, dedicated group of people. And Allah knows best. It is true that most scholars have said that da'wah is فَرَدْ الْكِفَايَةِ and that it's a communal obligation. But I believe that statement has to be explained in context of Muslims living in Dar al-Islam where most of the people are Muslim, where Islam is dominant. Then we don't have the need for everyone to learn how to give da'wah and learn how to become a da'i. But switch the situation where you as a Muslim are a minority living amongst people, most of them who are not Muslim. No, then... I believe absolutely every single Muslim needs to learn how to become a da'i. So it's going to depend upon the situation. This is what I am saying. So brothers, can anyone now quickly revise for us the key points in respect to the methodology of da'wah? And I don't mean here whether da'wah is farad al-ayn or farad al kifaya but what is the most important point that we should understand about the methodology of da'wah? Who can remind us that's the way we go about doing it? Yes. First and foremost, uh, that Allah is one, calling people to oneness of Allah. Okay. La ilaha. That's it, that's it. So the first thing is the da'wah is to Allah, which means the da'wah is to la ilaha illallah. That is the first thing. All right? Excellent. What else? Yes. Our dawah should be in such a way, with such an intention that Allah should accept our deeds and efforts which we put. Okay, we have to have the correct intention. That's true. And the action has to be correct. But now I'm talking about the verses we have just been discussing. That is about the methodology. What method do we use in order to give dawah? This is more about your internal state. But I'm talking now about the external things that we have to do. What are some of the prerequisites we mentioned? Yes, Rahim. Speech. Okay, good. Dawah is primarily through speech. And what should match the speech? Your actions. Your actions, your character. So character is also important. We're not saying it's not important, it's very important. But on its own, it is not necessarily going to be effective. It can be. I'm not saying it's not. But it's not necessarily effective. Yes. You must have a good presentation. You must have a good presentation. Presentation. So what are the details of that good presentation? What did we say? Or what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the way of that presentation? Yeah, what do we need? Yeah. Words of wisdom as well as beautiful preaching. With wisdom, as well as beautiful preaching, and beautiful yes. preaching, and a mo'ida actually means an admonition. Yeah, mo'ida 
means like a bit of a telling off. You understand? Mawidha, yeah, means an admonition, not just preaching, admonition. This is why some scholars explain it to mean the day of judgment, the hellfire, the paradise, the akhirah, because this is like an admonition. Death, fear Allah, fear His punishment, you know, fear the consequences of what you're going to do. Some of them could be in this life. Yeah? Yes. As Allah says in uh, this ayah in which we said, in which it says, invite all to the way of their Lord with yes. wisdom, beautiful preaching, and argue with them, reason with them in the okay. ways that are best and most gracious. Yes. So, in one of the tafasis I read, that we need to recognize there are different level of people, different kind of peoples in the society. Some yes. are more intellect. Yes. So we need to deal with them intellectual basis. So okay. Allah uses the word hikmah, wisdom. And then we need to recognize there are some people who are not educated. So we need to use simple common sense to convey the message of Islam. So yes. different kinds of people, we need to uh, different. use different kind of strategy. Excellent. That's very, very good. With different types of people, we are going to use different types of strategies in Dawah. Okay. There's one other thing, just one more thing. Important thing. I give you a clue. The enthusiastic. Remember the enthusiastic guy? On a collective basis, Jama. Yes, it should be on a collective basis. We need a team of people. That also implies we need to work together. We need to work in Jama. Very important. Jazakallah khair. There's one other thing I'm looking for. Yes. Looking for a good place. I mean, which make that people. No, that's not what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Go on, Arshi, yeah, go on. We need to have the proper knowledge. We need to have the proper knowledge. And yes. And to know how yeah. to transform that knowledge. Ala basira. Basira means knowledge. Certain and definite knowledge. Okay, so this is important. It doesn't mean that you have to be a scholar. And this is, by the way, brothers, a big trick that shaitan has played. He has made the Muslims think that giving da'wah is only for the scholars. Right? Giving da'wah is only for the special du'at. So, you know, even subhanAllah the scholars, they don't give da'wah anymore. Right? They form the du'at. Abdurrahim, come. The imams of masjids, muftis and mulanas. For Abdurrahim, I have a new Muslim, come and talk to them. SubhanAllah. But this is just a trick of shaitan. You don't need to be a scholar. Actually, all you need to know is you need to know what you're talking about. That's what you need to know. So as long as you know how to give da'wah and you understand and you know what you are saying, that's sufficient. You don't need to be a scholar. So the proof of that we've already mentioned. Ballighu anni wa Convey from me, even if it is one ayah. So, if you only know one ayah, are you a scholar? <laughs> You're not going to be a scholar or an imam. But, subhanallah, it doesn't make you a scholar. But even the Prophet saying, if you know one ayah, that's enough. Pass it on. Convey it. That's sufficient for you to be a da'i. Yeah? Even, subhanallah, you may not even understand it very well. Sometimes it's just enough just to pass it on. Because in the last sermon, the Prophet ﷺ said, let those who are present convey to those who are not present, because the ones who it is being conveyed to may understand it better. Subhanallah. So just passing information on accurately, you may not understand it completely, even the one you are talking to may understand it better than you. But as long as you are transmitting the information accurately, then even that is good. Of course, the problem comes if you are transmitting it inaccurately. You start saying something about Allah and His religion and His messenger that is not even true. That you are pretending you know and talking as if you know when you don't. We don't want to encourage that in any way, shape or form. So, 
this can also cause more harm than it does good. The point being here, brothers, is that Dawa does take some knowledge. It doesn't take a lot of knowledge and you don't need to be a scholar, but inshallah you should at least know what you're talking about. So part of what we hope to achieve in these workshops is teaching some simple techniques to give Dawa. I won't say anyone can learn it in a day. I can outline the main points in a day. Probably, inshallah, if you apply yourself, you can learn it in a day. To get good at it is going to take longer than that. But the basic ideas you can learn in a very, very short time. And that's really the core of this workshop is about learning those techniques or learning that technique. Although I don't want anyone to think that Dawah is confined to it. No, of course not. There's many different ways of giving Dao. I look at it as almost emergency first aid. If someone's dying of a heart attack, do you need to be a doctor to save their life? Do you have to be a heart surgeon? Do you? No, it's great if every single person, they say if every single person learned basic CRP, is that what they call it? Yeah, CRP, then many lives would be saved. Just a few things that you can do. A few techniques, if someone's airways are blocked, what do you do? If someone, simple movement recovery position, put them into recovery position, know how to kickstart their heart. A few simple things, if everyone learnt it, lots of lives would be saved. No one expects you to be a doctor or a heart surgeon to do these simple things. So the sort of techniques we are going to be teaching is like that. It is those emergency first aid. Or even you could compare it in martial arts. Martial arts, subhanAllah, to be, you know, mixed martial arts. These guys learn five or six or seven different forms of martial art. It's not even enough to be good at one these days. So there are so many movements and so many forms and, you know, you spend a lifetime studying. But it's useful for everyone to know a few techniques of self-defense, right? So this is like that. If every single Muslim could learn a few of these techniques, a few of these first aid techniques, we could call them in da'wah, alhamdulillah, this would be fantastic. Most people, it will be enough for them. Then, when you reach some hard cases, you reach some people who are a bit hard to get through to, okay, that's when you can now call in the experts, call in the people who have a bit more knowledge. You see? But most of the basic stuff, alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters, you can learn it yourself. Okay, so let's examine another hadith of the Prophet wasallam that also shows and indicates how da'wah to some degree is an obligation upon everybody. And this is a very well-known hadith narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and he relates that he heard the Prophet wasallam say, if anyone notices something evil, he should change it with his hands. And if he cannot change it with his hand, he should change it with his tongue. And if he cannot change it with his tongue, he should at least hate it in his... And that is the weakest... Yes, exactly, thank you. That is the weakest form of Iman. So brothers and sisters, this is a really strong indication that everyone who sees evil should try to do something to stop it. So this really suggests that the nature of this is something that's an obligation upon everyone. Sometimes you cannot change evil with your hand because you may not be allowed to, you may not have the authority, or for example, even the Sharia may not allow you to change that particular evil with your hand. For example, if you are a Muslim, living in a, a non-Muslim land and you see people selling alcohol. Can you go and destroy the alcohol and smash up their shops? Can you do that? No. Even by the way, if they were Christians living in a Muslim land, you still couldn't do that. It's not allowed for you to do that, by the way. Alright? That's part of what the Sharia allows them. But sometimes there is another reason why you shouldn't change an evil with your hand. And that is also to do with the fiqh of da'wah. 
And part of the fiqh of da'wah, or this is also you can say the fiqh of enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong, is that when you are trying to change an evil, you should not create or make a bigger evil. Right? Because the purpose is to increase good and to decrease evil. So if in trying to change the evil, you cause more evil to occur, you didn't enjoin right and forbid wrong, you actually enjoined evil and forbade good. And there's a famous example of this, when some of the students of Ibn Taymiyyah, they used to come across the, the Tatars, and they used to be drunk, lying in the street. And so his students asked him, shouldn't we prevent them? This is evil, shouldn't we prevent this evil? And Ibn Taymiyyah said, no, you should leave them. Because if you wake them up, and you stop them from this, they will start killing people. They just used to go and kill people. So it's better that these people are drunk than they are awake and slaughtering people. So you may try to prevent them from one evil, but in doing that, you actually go and cause something even worse to take place. This, by the way, is part of hikmah. This is an important dimension of dawah. And so it's for this dimension of enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong where more knowledge becomes important. Yes. Is it okay in this case, like sometimes people, they get into stress and they might commit a bigger sin. So they, supposing somebody gets very stressed, almost yes. stressed. They get stressed, I yeah, understand. Psychologically. That. And uh, they need some relaxation. So, uh, so instead of, if they don't, they might commit much bigger sins. So they go for smaller sins like watching movies and etc. Is that justifiable? Generally, anyway, in Islam, sometimes in order to prevent a bigger evil, you will do a smaller evil. And this is really only when there is a choice. Sometimes there is only choice between two evils. If there really is a choice, between two evils, then you should take the lesser of the two evils. But if you're talking about a situation where there are plenty of halal opportunities and halal ways to relax, then what excuse is there for you to take a haram way? Yeah, so then that's not an excuse. But the point here is that we should be careful when we are giving dawah that we don't create a worse situation. So, this is something sometimes we have to think about. Especially when we're working as dawah teams, we do have to try and make sure that in our enthusiasm to give dawah, we don't create a worse situation. This sometimes unfortunately has happened in the UK. The brothers, when they give dawah, maybe they do not use the best methods of preaching. They are very aggressive in the way that they approach dawah. And this, by the way, is all from a lack of knowledge of how to conduct oneself properly when you're giving dawah. So they cause people to be upset, and then maybe the authorities will come in and they will close down the dawah table, or they see something taking place, some evil. Certainly there's evil, then they try to correct it, but in correcting that evil, they cause a worse thing to happen. So for example, this is in a non-Muslim country, like UK, and there are women who are walking, and you know, many times the women Hardly, you know, they are dressing very, by our standards, not wearing very much by the standards of Islam. So the brothers think that, oh, we will stop this. I mean, the question, do they even have a right to do that? This is a different discussion, okay? But in trying to do that, they cause a lot of problems. And the evil that comes of it is more than the benefit that would have come from just getting some woman to cover herself a bit more. Even if that was likely, it's very unlikely that it's going to happen, that she's going to change. And even if she did change, what would be the benefit vis-a-vis -vis the harm that would come upon the Muslim community? Or even the brothers giving dawah themselves. So these are important things to consider. Another thing that is very controversial, and we have to be very careful about this. However, as Muslims living amongst non-Muslims, our da'wah will not get very far if we don't understand this principle. And that is that 
in order to bring a great good, it is permissible to fall into some small harm. Yeah? So in order to bring a great good, it is permissible to fall into some small harm. And I will give you an example. In England, in London, we have a place called Speaker's Corner. Speaker's Corner is a place where anyone can go up and speak about anything. And you can find videos on YouTube of this. And I used to go down there for years and years. Then some brothers, who I think they must have thought they were very pious brothers, and maybe they were, inshallah, they were pious, they started complaining. How can you go to that place, Abdurrahim? It is full of people, especially in the summer. There are so many naked women. There's so much haram taking place. How can you go down there and talk about Islam? And this is not right. And this is not the way of the Salaf. And they were saying these types of things. So they kept on saying and saying these things to me until even I myself became confused. But I said to them, Brother, the delil for this, the delil is for me, the Prophet wasallam used to go to the Kaaba where they were worshipping idols and people used to make tawaf naked. I'm not saying the Prophet necessarily was there when they were making tawaf naked, but generally we know people used to make tawaf naked. So I said, I don't think Speaker's Corner is bad as that. But the Prophet used to go there and give down. No, no brother, I don't think you should do it. So anyway, I asked a scholar, in fact I asked this scholar to come down to Speaker's Corner to see for himself. Not just to take my word for it, come, I said, Sheikh, and see what is going on down there. So the Sheikh came down and he spent the whole day there, subhanAllah. Afterwards he said, Abdurrahim, don't leave this dawah, even if the Khilafah is established. This is what he said. He said, your dawah here has more reward than praying in Mecca every day. Praying in the haram every day. I said, but Shaykh, you know, how about all of this fitna? And he said, didn't the Prophet used to go down to the Kaaba and they were worshipping idols and exactly what I had said, the Shaykh said the same thing. So subhanAllah, right? So unfortunately, this is ignorance from another angle. And this is a failure to understand, lack of fiqh, lack of understanding. And the strange thing is these same brothers, when it goes to work, it's not a problem. They will go to work. And the women will be dressed in the same way or undressed in the same way. They walk down the street, they will see the same thing. They do not sit in their homes and just order the food from the supermarket and never see anybody. So why is it when it comes to da'wah, suddenly, no, no, we can't do this. This is not right. So meaning, of course, there is some evil. If you are giving da'wah, it may be that, you know, there will be the presence of things that are not the best situation for a Muslim to be in. But if your real purpose and your real intention is to give dawah, as long as the harm is small. So this is the difference, for example, between being in the presence of women who are not properly dressed and a maid, that's not a major sin. But actually, of course, fornicating is a major sin. Being in a situation where there may be some alcohol present is not a major sin. But actually drinking the alcohol is a major sin. So this also sometimes this needs a bit of understanding and knowledge of Sharia. So then again brothers, this is the importance of having scholars, having people of knowledge, referring these things to people of knowledge. And that is also the benefit of subhanAllah, being in a group, being in a jama'ah, being organized, having those points of reference. But anyway, most of what we're talking about over these series is not going to be about these type of situations. Really, all we're talking about is you giving dawah in the same everyday situation scenarios that you find yourself in. So if you're going to university and you find yourself sitting with these girls and these boys, it's very strange that a man, a brother will be ready to talk to this person and that person when it comes to their coursework. So they will talk. When it comes to coursework, they will talk. They will interact. But then suddenly when it comes to dawah, no, no, I, I can't do that. Why? If your dunya allows you to do this, surely your deen has more of a right on you. However, as we're going to explore later, 
We must never make da'wah an excuse to do haram. And we should also not make certain haram an excuse not to give da'wah. So we have to be balanced in this matter. So if anyone notices something evil, they should change it with their hands. The point being, sometimes you cannot change something with your hands. It's not always that, it's a weakness in your iman. Sometimes the situation does not allow you to do it. But at least you could change it with your tongue. At least you could say something about it. And if you can't do that, at least the minimum is hate the evil in your heart. And one sheikh, he said to me, he said, at least you can make dua. That's the very least you can do, is make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change that evil and to change that situation. And never underestimate the power of dua. So these are some things, my brothers, that we can do, inshallah. What is the greatest evil? Can anyone tell me, brothers, what is the greatest evil? Yes, Rahim, what's the greatest evil? Shirk. The greatest evil is shirk. That is without doubt the greatest evil. So most of us Muslims living amongst non-Muslims, we are surrounded by shirk in one form or another. And also this is the priority of da'wah. Remember what Aisha said? Remember what Aisha said? The Prophet did not start by saying to the people, stop fornicating, stop drinking alcohol. So the first thing he starts dealing with is the issue of shirk. And we can also understand this from those ayat of Quran. So the call is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to la ilaha illallah. And this also Allah mentions was the call of all the prophets. That Allah is saying we did not send to any nation a messenger except that he called the people to worship Allah and abandon the worship of false gods. So the primary task and goal of every messenger was to call people to worship Allah and to abandon the worship of the false gods. Okay, what we want to talk about now is we want to talk a little bit about the punishment. Yes, the punishment for not giving dawah. We've talked about the rewards of dawah. We've talked about the benefits of dawah. We've talked a little bit about the fiqh of dawah, the understanding. What is the status of it? All of us have an obligation on dawah depending on upon our circumstances. But what we haven't talked about is what happens when we don't give dawah. Let's start with a very small, and everyone can remember this inshallah. If you want to give a little talk to your family, to your mom and dad and your sisters and your brothers, your relatives, your cousins, you know, instead of sitting down and watching movies, I don't know what other things people do these days, how they waste their time, why don't you sit down and give them, mashallah, a nice advice, a mawa'idha. Anyone can give a little talk around this small surah of the Qur'an, which is really about da'wah. Does anyone know what surah I'm talking about? Yeah? Surah Al-Asr, yes. Exactly, mashallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين عامنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. So Allah swore He took an oath by time. Time is running out. The time is running out. The hourglass, you know, with the sand in. That's it. The minute you are born. Your sand started to run out. The day you were born, you started to die. Every second is one more second closer to the end. That's your life. Your life is just like a calendar, bro. A calendar, you're just taking off the days. But this calendar, you don't know what the last day is. You don't know. You know the calendars you buy, you take off a day, you know at the end of the year is the end. But your calendar, my calendar, we don't know. When is it? Wal asr. The time is running out. So Allah emphasizes verily, definitely, all of the human beings 
are in a state of loss. So everybody is a loser. Every human being is lost. All of the human beings are lost. Except those who have Iman, they have faith. That's good. And they do good deeds. And that's it, right? I have Iman, I do good deeds, I do my Salah, I do my Namaz. I do my fasting, my psalm, my, what do they call it? Rosa. I don't know why they just don't call it psalm, but I do my Rosa. Yeah? That's it. I'm alright. I have Iman. I have my Amilus Salih. That's it, right? I is finished. Surah is finished. Is it finished? No, it doesn't finish, does it? Wait a minute. If you want to be saved, if you want to be those people who are not lost, it's not enough just to have iman and to have righteous actions. Because Allah says two more things. Which means that they join together in teaching truth. So this quality and this attribute of being teachers of truth is essential. If not, you are lost. You are a loser. You will lose. You will suffer in this dunya. This is what the Prophet ﷺ told us. Is you can find this from the Quran. You can find this from the Prophet ﷺ. There are many verses in the Quran that give us this meaning and also hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that tell us. The meaning of them is that if we abandon struggling in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if your fathers and your mothers and your children and your homes in which you delight, and your businesses in which you fear a decline, they are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger and striving hard in His cause, struggling in His path, then wait until Allah brings His decision. And the Mufassirun said it means His punishment. It means the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we struggle, when we give up the struggle, the word is jihad. And jihad means what? To struggle to the utmost of your ability to do what? What is the purpose of jihad? To do what? I'm asking you brothers, what is the purpose of jihad? To do what? Huh? To strive to do what? To strive to get money? You could make jihad to get money, right? You could get jihad to get land, you could fight to get land, you could fight to get booty, you could fight to capture people, to make them your slaves, you could fight for an empire. Is that jihad? Is that jihad? Is that what we recognize as something good in Islam? Is that acceptable with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that what He wants? No. What is it for then? To establish the deen of Allah. Okay, to make Allah's word the highest, to establish the deen of Allah. So when you are fighting jihad bil nafs, it means you struggle against your base desires. That's what you're doing. Your base desires say, oh, I want that woman. I want that house. I want that car. I want that money. I don't care how I get it. Who cares? Is it halal or is it haram? I just want it. That's your nafs. That's your desires. So when you struggle against your nafs, it is to make your nafs. First of all, the basic level is not to give in to those things. But ultimately your objective is so that you only want what is halal. You understand? So then your nafs, Allah's word is the highest. You want what Allah wants. You love what Allah loves. So this is a struggle inside yourself to make Allah's word the highest. And it also with your tongue. That's dawah, you see. Da'wah is jihad with the tongue. It's also jihad, a struggle. Why? Because people everywhere are criticizing Islam, attacking Islam. It may be on the internet, it may be in the public sphere, wherever it is. So that is the struggle, what? To make Allah's word the highest, so that people know that Islam is the truth. It's a struggle, it's an effort. If we don't make that effort, Allah says, wait till his punishment comes. 
means you're going to lose in this life. Yes, maybe, inshallah, in the akhirah, you might go to hell. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. This is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course. In the akhirah, if you have iman, you've done righteous actions, alhamdulillah, we know, even a person who has an atom's weight of iman will come out eventually of hellfire. But in this life, you will definitely suffer. You will lose. Your lands will be taken. You will be humiliated. And this is what the Prophet said. Soon the people will gather together to take from you in the same way you invite people to share in a feast. Is that because of our small numbers or messenger of Allah? They were thinking, maybe we're so weak we can't fight. He said, no, your numbers will be many. You'll be like the foam on the sea. But you will be like the rubbish that is carried by the flood. And Allah will take from your enemies the fear of you and into your hearts he will cast wahan. And they said, what's wahan, messenger of Allah? And the Prophet said, it's love of life and fear of death. See, because why? People are no longer struggling, making an effort. They're just hanging, as another hadith says, when you hang onto the cow's tail and you abandon jihad. So you abandon that struggle to make Allah's word the highest. And you just hang on to the cow's tail. It means you just get happy with plowing your fields and going to work. Allah will humiliate you at the hands of your enemies. And He will not lift it from you till you return to your deen. And that indicates that the very essence of this deen is this struggle, this effort that we make. And it is a blessing, brothers and sisters listening, that Allah has made it for us that the doors of da'wah are so easy and so open. You think about what the Prophet ﷺ went through. You think about what Rasulullah ﷺ, he sacrificed for da'wah. Think about it. Think about when the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if. Think about that journey walking on foot for days from Mecca to Ta'if, climbing up into the mountains. And then the people, the leaders refused to listen to him. And then he goes according to some books of Sirah, he is knocking on every single door. Every single door. He is knocking on it. Hoping that someone will accept Islam. He is rejected by everyone. Everyone rejects him. Not one person becomes Muslim, brothers. And then as the Prophet ﷺ is leaving, the leaders order the urchins of the street to stone Rasulullah sallallahu to throw stones at him. And the blood is flowing down through the body of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much so that his sandals are sticking to his feet. His sandals are sticking to his feet. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the people say, oh we love the Prophet. We love Rasulullah. Do you? Really? Brothers, sisters, do you love your Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Look what he suffered to call the people to Islam. And then look what happened after this, how much he cared. Because when Jibreel came to him and he said, Oh Muhammad, just give us the order. Just tell me and the angel of the mountains will crush these people. And the Prophet said, No, don't do that because maybe from their offspring, their children, their descendants will be people who will accept Islam. Do you see how much the Prophet cared about the people becoming Muslim? Do you see this concern, this love the Prophet had for the people to come to Islam? Yet there are so many people say we love Rasulullah and they live amongst non-Muslims and never even tell them about Islam. Then they are liars. A hundred percent they are liars. They do not love the Prophet ﷺ. That's a lie. You are a liar if you say you love the Prophet and there are people around you who are not Muslim and you don't give them da'wah. You're a liar. If you love the Prophet, you will love what he loved. If you love the Prophet wasallam, you will dedicate your life to doing what he did. You will be concerned about what he wasallam, was concerned about. So look at these sacrifices. So everyone is going to be lost. Except those who make that effort, that make that struggle, that make that sacrifice. And that needs what? Sabr. It needs sabr, it needs sabr. You are never going to achieve any of this without sabr. It's not going to happen like that, brothers. So you need to know this from now. Brothers sitting here, brothers and sisters watching this program, 
giving da'wah needs sacrifice and it needs sabr. And you don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Because the humiliation that we will suffer and the pain that we will go through when we don't make da'wah, when we don't try to make the word of Allah the highest, is going to be more than what you would go through if you made that effort. Allah will humiliate you at the hands of your enemies. Look at what has happened to us. Look at what has happened to us. Look at our lands. Look how many of our lands suffering, occupied. How many Muslims? How our deen is mocked and ridiculed in the media every day. And there is so little that we can do about it. This is a consequence of us abandoning this dawah, this effort to make Allah's word the highest. You see, so this is why dawah is so important. A brother subhanAllah, he said to me, Oh, what shall we do for the Muslims in my land? Many of them are becoming Christian. Shall we concentrate on preserving their iman? Or shall we give dawah to the people who are not Muslim? I said, subhanAllah, how are you going to preserve the iman of the Muslims if they are not giving dawah to non-Muslims? In other words, that's the problem. The fact that we're not giving dawah is the very reason why people are apostatizing and leaving Islam. Because you're going to be one of two types of people, brothers and sisters. Either you are a da'i, in other words, either you are calling or you are called. So either you are the one who is calling people to Islam or you are being called to something other than Islam. Is there anything else for you? Is there any other in between? No. So this, subhanAllah, that saying the best form of defense is attack doesn't apply more truly than this case. Not that Dao is attacking, of course, I don't mean it in that sense, it's inviting. But the point being is without this proactive, what I call a proactive mentality, a proactive approach. And this is all to do with our psychology. How we think about ourselves. How do we think about ourselves as Muslims? Do we think about ourselves, O Muslim brothers, in India? in UK, in America, or wherever you are watching this program, how do you think about yourself as a Muslim living amongst non-Muslims? Do you think of yourself as people who are taking from the society? Do you think of yourself as being inferior? And I don't mean here, yes, some Muslims have a very arrogant attitude. But in reality, when we look at them, the way they behave is very servile. Really in your heart, do you look at the West as superior? Most people do. Scientifically, technologically, sociologically, militarily, educationally, people have this awe of the West. Do you really think that you have something to offer? See, this is the thing. How do you look at yourself? Do you look at yourself as a taker or do you look at yourself as a giver? That's it, and we'll be continuing next time, inshallah. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Make sure you all come, brothers. Inshallah. We'll see you then. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.